estimation. Prabhupada has opened up the door of eternal life in a very, what we say, wide way. Wide in the sense that he's made it available to everyone and anyone. He shows us his, through his books, through his life example, through his words, he's showing us the futility of material happiness. The futility of chasing after material happiness. How it all ends in frustration, suffering, and ultimately we have to leave this particular place. And but he teaches us something even more, and what is that? Our eternal relationship with Krishna. And in teaching that eternal relationship with Krishna, he used one bhajan that was written and sung by Sri Maratam Dasakar, which we just sung Guru Vandana. Sri Guru Charanapadma Kevala Bhakati Sadma Ando Muni Sarvadana Mate. Prabhupada explains what that means, the meaning of each of the lines of that. Shilanartam Das Thakur is special. Why? Because although he was a great philosopher and also a great writer of philosophical bhajans, he was able to do something that no many persons who, who could both write and to, who could sing, and he would combine the two elements with the perfect philosophical conclusions on all scriptural phenomena. Evidence. In other words, his bhajans were pure shastra. Not just expressions of devotion, but pure expressions of loving devotion with all philosophical conclusions from the shastra. And one of them, which is the one Prabhupada introduced in our name, is Guru Bhandana. Sri Guru Charana Padma the lotus feet of the spiritual master, Kevala Bhakti Sadma. What is that? That at the feet of the spiritual master lies the principle and process of pure devotion to Krishna. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't create it. You can't get it by reading books. You can't somehow or other find ways, you can't even pray to Krishna directly to get it. You have to go to where it is, there's only one place. And Krishna makes that treasure of pure love for himself available through devotion to his spiritual representative, the spiritual master. So Narantam Das Thakur says, at the lotus feet of the spiritual master lies the element of pure bhakti. Shiguru Sharanga, Lotus Feet, Padma, Kevala, Kevala Bhakati. Kevala means spiritual, or the essence of spiritual. Sadha. See, Kevala Bhakati, Sadma. Everything is there in pure devotion. Mando Muli Sarvadana Mate. So, in the mood of the disciple, glorifies his spiritual master. Srila Lokanath Das Goswami, Nantam Das Goswami, is saying that I want that, that pure bhakti, and you have it. How do I get it? By submission to your lotus feet. What is the mood of my submission? With great awe and reverence. And Prabhupada would always explain, sometimes when he would explain the essence, he will explain what is not the essence. But what we should avoid in trying to get the mercy of the Lord. And he said, Bandam Muhi Sarvadana Mate means, I bow down to the lotus feet of the spiritual master. With what? With great awe and reverence. It's not that the spiritual master is looking for glorification or eulogies, or anything on the personal level. But because he's been 
designated by the Lord, he wants to represent Krishna in the best possible way. It becomes a responsibility of this for the spiritual master to put himself in a position of being Krishna's value media. So the worship of the spiritual master is not is the worship of Krishna. Because the transcendental via media is the spiritual master. Now, a, a spiritual master is not a spiritual master if he's not transcendental, or he's not a via media. What does that mean? If he keeps anything for himself, if he becomes enamored by the worship of his disciples, by the glorification that he receives, by the remuneration or anything, he becomes what we say null and void. He blocks the transmission. As when we say sometimes when the sun is out, someone can choose not to be in the sunlight by blocking the sun with various elements. Although standing in the presence of the sunlight, they receive no sun because they're blocking it with their hands or with other elements. So in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one transmits or transfers or gives up that idea that I, whatever is coming to me is for me. It goes to Krishna. And how does that happen? It happens by remembering what his spiritual master has brought to him. And therefore, in order to offer that to Krishna, he offers it to his spiritual master. Who offers it to his spiritual master? Who offers it to his spiritual master? All the way up to Krishna. And Krishna is called Adi Guru. He is that guru, which is the origin of all gurus, and actually he's the only guru. But he manifests himself as himself in the form of the spiritual master who becomes the mercy manifestation of himself. So he can receive those worships through his representative. And therefore, when one worships something to give something to the spiritual master, it's worship of Krishna. It's worship of Krishna. When everything is in the proper consciousness. So that's that that is what real so Bandha Muhi Sarvadana Mate. I bow down with great awe and reverence. I don't bow down simply because I have to bow down or because everyone else is bowing down. <laughs> One time when there was a Guru Puja going on in the temple and Prabhupada was there in Los Angeles, um, there was a guest. And the guest didn't really understand too much about spiritual life. So when it was time to bow down, and Prabhupada was chanting the the in Dwani prayers. Everyone bowed down except his guest. So later the guest came up to Prabhupada. Quite, quite soon he said, why is everyone bowing down? And then Prabhupada explained, because we are honoring Krishna's representative. And Prabhupada said, if you bow down, you will also get the benefit. <laughs> So Prabhupada put himself in a position of acting like he was needing someone to bow down to him and feeling what we say. But it was the, his mercy. He was simply saying, if you want to benefit also, you bow down. <laughs> in other words, they're benefiting, but you don't understand. So you can understand something by doing or you can experience it simply by doing it. Sigaru Mate Bando Sumu Muhi Sarva Dhanamate Yanhara Prasade Vai E Bhava Turiyayai The spiritual master 
takes one across the ocean of material existence. Prabhupada says this material world is a great ocean. It's full of various types of sharks, fishes, whales, strong waves, currents, unlimitedly deep, unlimitedly wide. No one can swim across the ocean. Even the greatest swimmer in existence cannot make it. Why? Because the ocean is just too insurmountable. So no one can somehow free themselves from the suffering of material life, nor can one find permanent and eternal pleasure in this material life. Therefore, it's a struggle to live in this world. But therefore, the spiritual master comes with the boat of devotional service and with the strong winds of his instructions, he carries the passenger across this ocean of material existence that is full of birth, death, old age and disease. Sometimes we hear Prabhupada say, what are the miseries of material life? He sums it up in these four things, birth, death, disease and old age. We don't remember what it was like to be born, but nobody comes out dancing. Usually you come out and the doctor slaps you on the butt and then you start breathing. Before then you're kind of blue in color, you're not Krishna. You're kind of squashed, you come out of this small hole and you're just like can't even breathe. Prabhupada used to talk about how one of his disciples was an uh, a employer on an ambulance. On an ambulance. And then many times they would get calls from pregnant mothers who were in labor and they would drive their ambulance to pick up the lady and take her to the hospital. But on the way, Many times those ladies were undergoing tremendous suffering. I think maybe those ladies have had children. Maybe can understand a little bit about what I'm saying. But then this devotee was telling Prabhupada, many of the ladies would say, never again. Never again. I'm not going to do this again. Well, what happens? They do it again. <laughs> So, birth is not a very pleasant experience. In fact, it's a very difficult thing for both the mother, but because the mother's love is there, she shadows over a whole her inconveniences with her love for her child. But the process itself is not very pleasant. It's not very pleasant. So that's why birth is included as one of the material motions, because the soul does not have to take birth. It's unnatural for the soul to take birth. Therefore, birth becomes something that is a unnecessary part of material existence and forced upon the being. And then, of course, there is old age, and between that, there are so many diseases. Many of you are young, there's a few of you are old here. Just ask the old people what it's like. I'll tell you, <laughs> it's not easy carrying around this big burden. It's a weight. As you get older, it becomes more and more a burden. You can't see straight, you can't hear correctly, you're walking, the machine just doesn't work <laughs> the way it used to work. And as time goes on, it gets worse and worse. So old age and disease, they kind of like partners in the misery inflicted upon And then, of course, death finishes again. <laughs> so this is material existence, but it's not for the devotee. It's not for the devotee. Why? The devotee takes shelter of Krishna's representative, becomes fixed in executing the devotional service, and transcends the suffering of material existence by the mercy of the spiritual life. So that spiritual master, who is already on the other side, he takes the boat back, to go, he crosses the ocean back to pick up those who are still waiting to get across. He's made it. 
But he comes back out of his own, what we say, desire to please Krishna and to serve the conditioned selves by giving them Krishna's mercy, he comes back. And then he takes whoever wants to go, and sometimes they don't want to go, but sometimes he enforces it. You are suffering, I have the remedy. And the, the medicine is the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, the eating of wonderful foodstuffs offered to the Lord Krishna Prashana, and engagement in practical activities in service to Krishna. And he gives the medicine, and those who are a little bit intelligent can I understand that this is something worth taking. And then we hop on the boat of the, the mercy of Krishna in the form of the spiritual master's instructions, and we sail across this great ocean of material suffering. And then where do we go? Krishna. Yadhara prasadi bhai, e bhava tariya, Krishna prakti hoi. Yanya Hotel. He takes you to Krishna's lotus feet. He brings you only to one place. He's not trying to somehow or other make you successful in material life or increase your happiness in whatever form you're trying to get that happiness in. He doesn't give you simply freedom for material miseries, he puts you at the loving service of Krishna. In other words, his, his service to Krishna is to bring others to Krishna through devotional service. And Krishna is there to receive the lost soul who has been struggling in Krishna's sense. Thank you very much. Welcome home. You come back home. You have re realized that your relationship with me is your only happiness. It is your only satisfaction. The next verse, Prabhupada explains. Um, the instructions to the words of my spiritual master is what gives me nourishment. The body is nourishment by food, by air, by exercise, by proper maintenance. But the soul, you, the individual person who resides in the body, is nourished by the words of the spiritual master. <coughs> that nourishment is it gives transcendental knowledge, it frees one from material suffering, and awakens transcendental happiness. So therefore, in this song, Narakam Das is saying, this is what I feast on, the words of my spiritual master. It's a great feast. I can't get enough of it, I never get the full, and I only want more. So when we become attached to Krishna, we want to become more and more fixed in that attachment by hearing more about Krishna to the spiritual master. And then the next line, I'm fixed. I'm not going anywhere else. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm looking for. These words transport my consciousness beyond the sufferings of this material world, destroy all illusions about happiness in this world, and bring me to Krishna. So it's nourishing, it's fulfilling, one becomes fixed in hearing. Siguru Charani Ratni, he say Uttamagata Ye Prasari Purvi Sangaras. And then he goes on, Narayana goes on and starts to explain, now, now I am fixed in hearing the words of my spiritual master. I'm attached to that. I, his words, his instructions become my everything. And this is, this is important. It's not that the spiritual master wants everyone 
to listen to him because if he doesn't, he figures, uh, well, you know, I'll try somewhere else. No. His idea is that people are suffering. He's got the most. What is happiness? My poor Chandra, please come in. Uh, come on in. Thank you. Please get a chair for Mother Kamalini. Yeah. Hare Krishna. And what, what is happiness? I'll ask you that question. What is real happiness? <coughs> what makes you happy? What makes, what is the essence of, of the element of happiness in your life. If you love somebody and you do something and they become happy because something you do causes them happiness, what happens to you? You become more, you become more happier than they do. Love means to experience the happiness that others have experienced in their happiness. That's just love. So the spiritual master loves Krishna. And he knows that Krishna loves everyone. So when the spiritual master can bring others to the happiness by the way of devotional service, he becomes happy. It's not that his happiness depends on what situation, whether people glorify him or not, or glorify his activities, or offer this. In other words, it's not about him. It's about giving Krishna to others, and when people take Krishna, the spiritual master is satisfied. was in Atlanta, Georgia, 1975. He was giving a lecture, and one devotee said, and the devotee was a Sankirtan devotee, and you, we all know how much Prabhupada liked his books distributed. So this devotee was trying to get a little verification from Prabhupada about book distribution. So the question came, Srila Prabhupada, what pleases you most? Very direct question. And they are, he was thinking, yeah, distributing my books. What Prabhupada said was, what pleases the spiritual master most is that you love Krishna. When the spiritual master sees you developing your love for Krishna, your attachment for Krishna, he thinks, success, success. In other words, he feels that what he's come for is being achieved. And that gives, gives the spiritual master great satisfaction. Because he knows Krishna becomes satisfied. And then, Yeshvasadipurvesarvahas, Naratam Das Thakur says that whatever desires you have, both material or spiritual, whatever desires you have, don't try to fulfill them, but just try to become engaged in devotional service of the Lord, and all your desires will be filled perfectly and completely. When we try to fill, fulfill our desires separate from Krishna, in a material way, even if we somehow succeed, the results are never satisfied. But when we serve the Lord and please the Lord and please the spiritual master by being enthusiastic in serving the Lord, then what happens is that whatever we desire in life becomes automatically what we say complete. There's two ways to fulfill desires. One is to get what you want and two is to lose the desire. So when you get something higher, whatever is lower becomes satisfied and then you will just say, no longer important. And we see that in Krishna consciousness, especially in our East Consciousness. 
devotees come with so many maybe material desires, they push them aside, they engage in devotional service, and what does Krishna do? He gives them anyway. But they don't want him anymore. <laughs> At the beginning they wanted him. But now after tasting the happiness of devotional service and their relationship with Krishna, they look at the things that they looked for in the beginning of their Krishna consciousness as just an intrusion or just a diversion away from their real happiness. They don't see this statement. Why? Because they're tasting something happy. They're tasting that they have a better relationship with Krishna. Chaksudan dilo ye. Janmi Janmi Prabhu say Prabhu say Janmi Janmi Pita say What is this? That we're born in this world and we're born into ignorance. So this material world is a place of ignorance. What is that ignorance? We're taught you are this body and your happiness is fulfilled the need and the demands of the body. That is the grossest for our needs. We are something different than this body, and we, and by fulfilling material needs and wants, we don't find happiness. Because happiness is not based on simply satisfying the senses, or the mind, or the intelligence. Happiness is an affair of the heart, and when the heart is filled with love for Krishna or happiness that comes by way of the process of devotional service. One doesn't have to look for happiness externally. One sees external happiness as just an extension of their internal relationship with Krishna and not separate. They may experience happiness based on the external things that they interact with. But it's only there because of the internal relationship with Krishna, not such a The materialists, they have the relationship with everything external, but there's no solid, there's no foundation. Therefore, they go from one situation to another, always unsatisfied, always looking for something more, something different. But the bodies can be satisfied with the basic, simple things, just chanting, Discussing Krishna consciousness together, serving together. I walked into the kitchen today and I saw five ladies cooking and they were all smiling and laughing. And they were all having a good time. I'm thinking, hmm, this is Krishna consciousness. I got out of there fast because I didn't want to interrupt their happiness. But it was a nice experience just coming in for about two seconds. And just so, how many times do we cook? A <laughs> hundred times, you know, a week maybe. <laughs> and, but now, when we're cooking for Krishna, and when we're associating with devotees, it becomes a wonderful and joyful experience. So, Janmi and Chaksudan, Chakshu means uh, eyes. Chakshudan Diloye. Janmi Janmi, life after life, the spiritual master is coming to open my eyes with what? With knowledge. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna compares light and knowledge as, the sana as two things that are non different. Light is compared to knowledge, is compared to light, darkness is compared to ignorance. So, the, in the ignorance of illusion, of thinking I'm this body, and my happiness depends on satisfying this body, the spiritual master says, no, you're not this body. You belong to Krishna. You're a Krishna part and parcel. You'll never find happiness through bodily relationships. You'll only find happiness with me. And the spiritual master gives that. What does he say? Divya Gyan Ride Prakasita. So Divya means transcendental. And Gyan means knowledge. So what is that transcendental knowledge? Is it Shastric knowledge? No, it's a, ba it's a basic principle that is so simple but yet so powerful. You belong to Krishna. 
That's who you are. Powerful. Right to the point, Prabhupada says, you belong to Krishna, nobody else. No. You have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna. That's your identity. It's not only your happiness, it's your identity. So you belong to Krishna. And you can never lose that, and you can, you can only forget it. And therefore the spiritual master comes to remind you who you are and where you can find that happiness. And then he goes on to say, what is that next line? Divyagyan Ride Prakas Prima Bhakti Vyaha Hoite Abhya Vinasayati. That when the Lord came to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I have so many plot problems. I have so many difficulties. Prabhupada, you come to me, I can kick it out. I can kick out the difficulties with the, with the, with the sort of transcendental knowledge. The spiritual master is equipped to destroy all our illusions or our difficulties in our practice of devotion. If we allow him, if we don't allow him, he can only do as much as we allow him. If we think we can do it ourselves, then we find ourselves struggling. And sometimes, many times, we just continue in that struggle. But the spiritual master, as someone said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, do you know everything? Yeah. And Prabhupada said, I am not Krishna. But I know what I need to know. So what is he saying? He knows what he needs to know to do his service, what is his service, to bring others to Krishna. That knowledge he has. Where does it come from? It comes from Krishna. So Krishna teaches, or what we say, empowers the spiritual master to help others. It's not that the spiritual master is such a great wise man and he can figure out everything. He gets his information from Krishna. Krishna empowers him with the ability to understand and the ability to transmit that knowledge to And Prima Bhakti Yama Hoite Abhinavi So he can also give you love of God. How is that? If, you're, if he's pleased with your devotional service, he says to Krishna, Krishna, please bless this person. And Krishna says, but he's a rascal. She's useless. But the spiritual master says, I know, but give him your mercy. I know he's useless. So therefore, it's like having a good lawyer. He can speak on your behalf even though you can't understand anything about the law. But that's the spiritual master. He somehow blesses the person by asking Krishna, please give him your mercy. We have that experience many times. As soon as someone prays for us, we're in a good position. And when the spiritual master favors you in whatever way, and his favor comes in two ways. Sometimes he chastises us. Or sometimes he corrects us in a way, in a way that we can somehow or other understand and change. And sometimes we get chastised and we think, oh, why didn't I get praised? I'm doing so many things. Well, maybe I should have, uh, you know, honestly recognizing all my good qualities. But Prabhupada says that this is his duty to see what is there that is blocking that individual from surrendering more or understanding more and therefore he uses this sort of transcendental uh, medicine. It's a little strong sometimes the medicine. But that's good because the medicine is always effective and it's not the application sometimes needs to be a little strong, but that's okay. We like that.
And then Vedic Dahi Rana Racharita. All the all the scriptures sing the glories of Krishna. And all the scriptures also glorify Krishna by glorifying his spiritual master, his representative. So Krishna what Krishna does is Krishna wants to glorify his representative more than he wants to hear his own glories. So Krishna arranges for his spiritual, his representative to get glorified throughout the, the scriptures. <coughs> Therefore, the spiritual master becomes very dear to Krishna. What's the next one? He's the friend of the devotee. What is that next one? See, Karuna. Karuna. Karuna means compassion. Sindhu, he's an ocean of passion. The other one, abundant. He can free one from the two. Lokanath, Lokanath, Jiva. Now we're getting into Narutam Das's direct glorification of his spiritual master. Lokanath Das is one. Haha Prabhu Kula Doya Deha Mura Pavachaya. This line. Is so important. Oh, saying, <coughs> my dear Lord, my dear spiritual master, O oh, representative of the Supreme Lord, you are so merciful, but still, I'm begging. You are merciful, you're giving your mercy, but still, I'm begging for it. What is he saying? I want to show how much I want your mercy by begging for that mercy. This is important. The mercy is there, but our eagerness to get the mercy has to be shown. If we say, oh, my spiritual master knows how fixed up I am, no, you have to show it. You have to show it by your activities and by your devotion. Then, he says, oh, yes, this person is English. We can't just routinely go through our devotional service. And because it's more than that, it's an expression of our heart that has to be connected with the knowledge we receive and applied in everything we do. So that eagerness is the foundation to open up unlimited volumes of mercy. You're merciful, I know that, but I want it. Give it to me, I'm begging for it, I'm chasing you for it. Don't hide from me. <laughs> almost, almost demanding the mercy. And that's that is the, that is the qualification or characteristic of a pure disciple. Who wants that mercy? Eager. Whatever I can do to get that mercy. And the last line is Trigovana. What is that? A Tribhuvan. Tribhuvan means in the three worlds, you're glorified in the three worlds. Why? You see, Krishna likes to glorify his devotee more than he wants to hear glorification of himself. When the spiritual master's glories get thrown all over the world in different ways, it's Krishna who's doing it. It's Krishna alone who's doing it. He wants to say, this person represents me. Always better than me. Of course, if the spiritual master never, never even considers I'm better than God, or I'm equal to God. The Krishna thing, it's like, Paul once said, it's like when you have a, a father, the father always wants the son to be better than the father. The son never thinks he'll ever be better than the father, but the father becomes so happy when the son does something. And the son, the father glorifies the son's activities as being better than the job. Just see my son, what he did for my daughter. So that's Krishna. Krishna does that. He wants to show, oh, this person is better than me. That's Krishna. So this is the picture. this is a beautiful song by Narutam Das And as I explained in the beginning, it's full of transcendental philosophical conclusions on all Shastras. It's not just a nice expression of pure devotion, but it's coupled with complete transcendental knowledge.
But it's a beautiful. Now what I'll do is I'll read my altar. I just feel like I should read this. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. It's not easy to write an offering to the spiritual master, especially to the Prabhupada. We've been, when, when they asked us to submit an offering to Srila Prabhupada, we say no duplicate offerings. In other words, don't do something that's already been done. So how many years have we been, we've probably been gone for 38 years, something like that, no, 40 years. 1977, 40 years. So how many th thousands of devotees have been writing? For, I mean, I always have to come up with something new. <laughs> so something a little different. So it's hard. Um, usually April 15th every year is the deadline for the offerings to Shiva Prabhupada. Usually at April 14th I start my offering. <laughs> because I'm always, I can't think of anything to say. So in the, in the last day I'm praying. I'm really praying. I got one day left, Krishna. Oh. And somehow something happens. It's like, it's always like that. Every devotee who receives the offering gets everything on the last day. <laughs> he always says, don't do that to me every year, but he, it happens anyway. <laughs> so I, this is what I wrote. It's a little long, <laughs> but I'll try to read it clearly. Umagyan timirandasya ganajana salakaya chaksa unmilitam yena tasmai shi guru maha I was born in the darkness of ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge and offered my respectful obeisance to him. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is very dear to Lord Krishna on this earth, having taken shelter of his lotus feet. Our respectful obeisances are unto you, O spiritual master, servant of Saraswati Goswami. You are kindly preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya Day and delivering the Western countries which are filled with impersonalism and avoidance. So it begins. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 12, describes the birth ceremony of Emperor Pariksha. How the sages glorified his spotless character and prophesied and herald the Emperor's future deeds, comparing them with those of the great souls of yore. In the same mood, we are able to see how you, dear Shiva Prabhupada, possess the character of many great sages and kings and perform activities as glorious as theirs. At your birth ceremony, an astrology calculated your horoscope and predicted he will one day be a great son who cross the ocean at the age of 70 and open up 108 temples. Such a prediction is truly phenomenal in all respects. In the year 1965, you told the Turkish subway conductor you met on the New York Park bench. Yes, I have many temples, but time is separating them. It is interesting to note that I received a letter, I'm talking now, it is interesting to note that I received a letter from a person who visited our Seattle, Washington temple. He described in this letter how the same subway conductor, by then very elderly, once came to the temple and, on seeing your murti on the Viesta sun, 
spoke very emotionally, recalling his meeting with you. By your kind mercy, his initial skepticism had been turned into a joyful experience. So the same subway conductor actually came later to one of our temples and saw Prabhupada's Merton. He was the same person that he met in 1965 in New York City on a park bench who had complete doubt when Prabhupada said, yes, I have 108 temples, but they're separated by time. And the man was thinking, this is a very nice man, but he's speaking so strangely. But then, somehow Krishna arranged for his skepticism to be destroyed, and he actually came to the temple. As I go on, as a small lad, he wanted to visit Jagannath Puri. So, with your help of your father, Gormohan Day, a miniature Rathiyatra cart was obtained, and Jagannath Hedis were molded exactly like those in Puri. For many days, the pastimes were enacted, attracting the participations of friends and family and other children of the neighborhood. This childhood pastime anticipated the day when you would initiate Rathiyatra festivals in numerous cities worldwide. Lord Nityananda, on the order of Lord Chaitanya, approached the most fallen and sinful Jagai Madai, Madai, and even though they injured him, he still gave them the highest blessing, love of Krishna. Yushiva Prabhupada went to a degraded area of the world, the New York City slums, and distributed the message of love of Krishna, despite often being must misunderstood, being chased by a drug-crazed hippie, robbed of your possessions, and forced to live day by day without any fixed residence. By writing the Puranas, the Itihastras, and the other books of Vedic literature, Srila Vyasadeva made the vast knowledge contained therein accessible to the people of Kali Yuga. He completed his work by presenting Srimad Bhagavatam. How is it possible to begin to understand this great literature without your bhakti Vedanta purports? You are rightly known as Veda Vyas of the 20th century because you translated more than 80 books of knowledge <coughs> and wrote detailed explanations on the texts. Lord Ramachandra, to rescue of his kidnapped wife, Mother Sita, the supreme goddess of fortune, crossed the vast ocean with an army of monkey soldiers. You, Srila Prabhupada, also crossed an ocean from the shores of America, and you created an army of devotees to Krishna from the monkey-like inhabitants. <laughs> we dutifully followed you around the world, assisting you in recapturing the fortune stolen by the materialistic non-devotees and converting them into dedicated soldiers in Lord Chaitanya's mission. You avowed obedience and firm determination, your avowed obedience and firm determination, to carry out the order of your spiritual master can only be compared to Sri Hanuman, his devotion to Lord Ramachandra, as he displayed superhuman feats to save Lakshman when he was wounded by the weapon of Indrajit and crossed the ocean to Lanka to find Mother Sita. Srila Haridas Thakur is glorified for his exceptional tolerance in in life-threatening circumstances, having undergone beatings in 22 marketplaces. The soldiers doing the beatings intended to kill him, yet Harinas Thakur showed his torturers compassion and prayed for their deliverance. When you crossed the great Atlantic Ocean, you suffered two heart attacks. You tolerated much physical discomfort for all your mind. You tolerated such severe disturbance just to show compassion to the conditioned souls of Kali Yuga by bringing them to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Lord Shiva is renowned as a very magnificent because he gives shelter to all, even to the Daichas. Shiva Prabhupada, he gave shelter to whoever you approached you, whether they were gentle or rough. You worked diligently, tirelessly training and engaging everyone who showed just a mustard seed of desire to learn and to serve. 
Pandava Arjuna, the great moment, his praise as being irresistible as fire and as unsurpassable as the ocean. And so, when speaking about Mayavad philosophy, you, Srila Prabhupada, were like a blazing fire, completely defeating all opposing arguments, and unsurpassable and shastrically establishing the absolute truth as Krishna, the supreme personality of Krishna. Just as Bharat Maharaj, the son of Rishabdev, expanded his family's name and fame, and thus the earth's planet began, became known as Bhargarshya. So by traveling around the world 14 times, we made known in every country the spotless fame of the Supreme Personality of God, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and his eternal teachings of Sanatana Dharma. As Grandfather Bhishma Day lay on the battlefield, his body pierced with many arrows, he instructed Yudhisthira Maharaj how to rule the kingdom and serve Lord Krishna. Similarly, in your last days on this planet, although greatly physically challenged, you kept on boldly speaking the message of Krishna consciousness, as well as instructing your disciples on how to preach and expand the movement more and more. This is recorded in your many conversations, all the way up until the time of your glorious departure. She looked out by your qualities and spiritual achievements are as innumerable as the rays of the sun. You are not different from the benevolent sunshine that purifies and gives health and happiness to all. Your glories are relished by all who are fortunate enough to come into your association. We have found the perfect guide, kind friend and master, and pure love of Krishna. Through divine grace, we, your disciples, look forward to the day when the whole world will read your books and sing your glories. I pray to live and serve more and more according to your eternal teaching, with great happiness and a lifetime of gratitude and service. Your servant, Chandra Mahesh.